All right, is that the all? Mm -hmm. or something. <laughs> trying to, trying to up the place. Yeah, okay. I thought you was casing them out. Okay. Huh? Now I want you to turn slowly that way. Okay. Real slowly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I got you like in line up. Oh, I wanted that pencil. Yeah, you know. I need a little, little number on the side. Okay. That's cool. That's the digital camera. Mm -hmm. okay, too. Kind of I wanted the pencil. See? I'm like... Why? 
down from this point. Savannah, the coast of Savannah, and North Carolina. 
just east of those coastlines in the Atlantic Ocean, there are a series of islands. Hilton Head Island is probably the most well known. That's a resort area. But there are other little bitty islands where, where Africans lived. There's a language that, or a dialect that's spoken down there called Geechee. And Geechee is a combination of Indian, American Indian, African, and European. And some of the words that they use are a combination of, of all of those languages. If you remember the word tote, how many of you are familiar with the word tote? Tote is an African word. It's not an American word, it's African. You'll, you'll also hear in those areas words said backwards, like instead of grasshopper, they'll say hopper grass. So it's, a, it's an interesting dialect that's spoken down there. And sometimes you can recognize what they're saying, and sometimes you can't. But that's where Mr. S Mr. Abbott was born in 1965. He was born right after slavery was eliminated, abolished. So he was born a free man. His parents were born slaves, but they were freed by their owners before the end of the Civil War. So they were free. African Americans too. At the, the, by the end of the Civil War, Mr. Abbott's parents had divorced. His mother moved to Savannah so she could practice hair culture or beauty culture. She was a hairdresser. And went to live on a, on a, on a piece of abandoned land in the city of Savannah. We found out that later that that land was owned by a, a German sea captain by the name of Henry Herman Sangstadt. Mr. Sangstack's son had just come back from Europe where he was educated and found this woman and her son living on his land and they became very good friends and they let her marry. Now Mr. Sangstack, who found Mr. Mr. Abbott and his mother was actually of African and German descent. His father, the German sea captain, had married an African slave her two children were considered slaves, and when she died, to keep them from having to be returned to slavery, or turned into slaves, he sent them to Germany to be raised. When the sea captain died, his son came back, and he found Mr. and Mrs. Abbott living, Mr. Abbott, the young boy, and his mother living on his land. And they became friends, and he married her, and they had seven other children, one of which was my grandmother. They moved to an area called Woodville, Georgia, which is a suburb of Savannah, very much like Evanston is to Chicago. And he became, Mr. Sengstack became a minister, and they started one of the first schools for blacks in Savannah. Remember, after the Civil War, it was illegal for, it was still illegal for blacks to be educated, and there were no schools for them. So Mr. Sengstack started a school for the black the former slaves that lived in his community. He also started a newspaper called the Woodville Times. And that's where Mr. Abbott learned to put together a newspaper. Mr. Abbott went away to school. He attended Hampton Institute. And there further learned more about putting together a newspaper. When he graduated from college, while he was attending college, he came to Chicago. He sang a tenor in the Hampton Institute Men's <coughs> Chorus. And during the World's Fair of the 1890s, Mr. Abbott came to Chicago to perform at that World's Fair. It took place in Hyde Park on the Midway Plaisance. And if you study Chicago history, you'll, you'll learn about that, that fair. Also at that fair was Booker T. Washington, who started Hampton Institute, I'm sorry, who studied, who started Tuskegee Institute. They became good friends. Mr. Abbott decided he liked Chicago from that experience. And when he graduated from college, he came to Chicago and went to Kent Law School. He was the only African American in his class and one of the first to graduate from Kent Law School. But because of the color of his skin, he couldn't practice law. He became discouraged and was thinking about going back to Savannah to work in the school that his sister now ran called Sangstack Institute, or Sangstack Academy. 
Uh, it's had a couple of names, but at that time, it was six that I had. <laughs> His father died just about that same time, and the stepfather that raised him and provided him with uh, all of the opportunities uh, to go to college and to learn the printing trade died. And he began to think of a, a fitting tribute to this man who had raised him. And the Chicago Defender became that tribute. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sensack died in 1904. In 1905, the Chicago Defender became a reality. Mm -hmm. And we have been putting out the paper ever since. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and the story continues. We hope that 2005, when we celebrate our 100th anniversary, mm -hmm. will be a, a wonderful occasion for this publication. And I expect that all of you all will be around to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> story, but you only have 15 minutes, so I, I, won't, I won't go much further. But I do want to tell you about something that started in 1923. How many of you know about Bud Milligan? You know about Bud Milligan. Everybody, Everybody, Everybody should know about Bud Milligan. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bud Milligan and share, share with you how you can participate. Okay. Bud Milligan is a fictitious Chinese character that's the patron saint of children. Mr. Abbott never had any children, but he loved them. He had lots of nieces and nephews, and he became uh, like a, a father to all of them. But he longed to have children of his own, and the one way he could do it was working through the newsboys. Back then, there were young men like, and girls yeah, like right. you, who delivered the newspaper across the city. They were called newsboys. In 1923, Mr. Abbott wanted to have a, a children's newspaper so that kids would be able to learn about culture, culture and current events and play games and all kinds of things in the newspaper. So he started the Bud Milliken pages. In 1929, he thought that it would be nice to have an event once a year when children who never got a chance to shine in the limelight would have an opportunity to show the world what they could do. But Billiken is your parade. It's for children from 4 to 94. <laughs> the young and the young at heart. But primarily for children from 12, 7 to 12. In recent history, we've started what's called the Bud Billiken King and Queen. And, and I say recent history, this goes back to the 40s because I know of some folks older than I who have been the king or queen of the Bud Billiken Parade. There's a contest that we hold every year. And in the pages of the Chicago Defender, I don't have enough for every one of you to get a copy of the paper, but there are 10 copies of the paper. And the chaperones can take one and make sure that a copy is made so that you can be a participant, you can apply to be, to compete for the King and Queen contest, okay? How do you win? To, to win the King and Queen contest, you have to get people to vote for you. And they vote for you by taking out subscriptions. So every subscription that comes in the Chicago Defender is a vote or, or votes, and I'm not sure the exact number. 